Before I introduce the next talk, uh, this, ta this session is sponsored by Tamnoon. Tamnoon is the managed cloud detection and response platform that turns CNAP and CSPM alerts into action, fortifying your cloud security fast. Our approach blends purpose-built technology, AI, and expertise for comprehensive cloud security management. This next uh, speaker is Sam Cox, and the talk is Discover the AWS Account ID of any S3 bucket. Sam, take it away. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Uh, really excited to be here. So yeah, you can see my ti the title of my talk is Discover the AWS Account ID of any S3 bucket, which is a very literal title, and I will literally explain how to do that. Um, but I hope also to explain like my thought process along the way and maybe how you could reproduce like some findings like this. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Tracebit, where we're putting cloud canaries in your AWS account for intrusion detection, things like S3 buckets, et cetera, which is a lot of fun. Um, and my background before that is all in software engineering. I'm, I'm not a security researcher. This is the first foray into security research I've ever done. Um, and yeah, any, any free time I get, I try and get out and about. Uh, this is my son and I at Stonehenge recently. Um, but I do have a particular interest in like, cloud security and cloud security techniques. And this, I'm sure you're all aware, is hacking the cloud, which is a great catalog of various different techniques and tactics in various different clouds to discover information. Um, and this is maintained by Nick Fischett. And this is where I first discovered a related technique, which was published by Ben Britz about three years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Ben's here this year. Um, but this was a very interesting technique. It immediately caught my eye. You know, it, it, I found it interesting that you could just deduce this information about the AWS account ID of a public bucket. Um, but when I was speaking to someone about this technique, they, was, they said, oh, it would really be useful for a private bucket. You know, um, most buckets are not public. Uh, and I, uh, you know, if we could extend this to a private bucket, that would be really interesting. And I, I agreed it'd be interesting. And since the idea was kind of planted in my head, I couldn't really think about anything else. And I decided I was going to see if there was a way to do this, uh, which I did subsequently find. And it, it generated quite a lot of discussion online, um, interesting, impassioned, lively discussion. Um, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I do, I do have some, some thoughts about this and you know, the unique nature of S3 being like globally namespaced and stuff, but um, I saw on the schedule tomorrow there's a talk by Jerome Brown. Um, I believe he may have like, operationalized or scaled some of the theory that I'm talking about today, so I'm, I'm going to sidestep this contentious issue and, and just talk about the theory. Um, so let's start with, with Ben's technique and how and why that works, and that's really where I started. I wanted to understand inside out how Ben's technique works. Um, so this, this flow chart or diagram, this is taken from the AWS documentation. Um, it's, it's a diagram explaining how cross-account IAM works within AWS, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. So in order to access a resource in another account in AWS, both the resource owner account via the resource policy, in this case a bucket policy, has to permit that action, and the principal account, um, for instance a role, that policy has to permit the action. They both have to permit it. And depending on how those various policies are configured, there, there are two possible action uh, outcomes. Either the request is allowed or it's denied. And so if we consider the public bucket case, first of all, where the resource account permits access to everyone, really it's our own policy that we're in control of which decides whether our request is allowed or denied. You know, we can change our policy and the result of that change can allow or deny the request, which, which basically provides us some information about our policy. So as much as I like that flow chart, I drew my own, my, my own diagram of this situation. So on the right-hand side, and we're still talking about the public bucket here, uh, the, the bucket policy of, of the public bucket permits everyone to access it. And on the left-hand side, the requester account, we also permit ourselves to access S3. OK, pretty standard stuff so far. Uh, so where does it get interesting? Uh, it gets interesting with the context keys. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of context keys, which are available in AWS. Um, and so essentially how this works is when you, when you make a request to AWS, AWS is going to gather up a lot of contextual information about things like the network, for instance, your IP address, properties of the principal, um, and like, yeah, request properties like tags, et cetera, timestamps. And in this case, um, resource properties. 
So this is uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting context key. This is the S3 resource account key, which reveals the, the account ID of the S3 bucket, the owner of the S3 bucket. Um, and these are great, these, these context keys. You know, they allow you to write a much more expressive IAM policy. Um, they're really powerful, powerful tools. Um, and they're so powerful, they actually potentially reveal like, more than you might anticipate in and of themselves, i.e. the account ID here. So how can we use that? We can write a policy like this one, which permits all actions on all resources contingent on the fact that the S3 resource account owner starts with one. Um, so here we're using a string-like wildcard match, and we say, yeah, as long as, as, long as whoever owns this bucket starts with one, uh, I'm good to, good to perform the action. Um, and so essentially what you can see here is putting that into practice in our example, the target bucket does indeed start with one. Um, we've applied this condition in a session policy to kind of scope ourselves down. Uh, but because the condition matches, we are, we are allowed to perform this request. And we know now that the account ID starts with one. Um, so the obvious next question is, well, okay, what's the second digit? And so we just rinse and repeat. We perform the same procedure again. And we speculate that maybe the second digit is also one. Um, in this case, it's not, and so our request is actually denied because you know, both the, re the resource owner and the principal account have to permit the request, and so we've kind of restrained ourselves from performing this request. Um, and in doing so, we've, you know, we've discovered more about this, this resource. Um, if you think back to that flow chart, we're effectively affecting the decision blocks. You know, we're testing a predicate about the resource by affecting the outcome of those, and we're seeing did we allow or did we deny. Um, and so to try and, to try and make this applicable or understand why this doesn't work for a private bucket, I, you know, I, I try to break down what, what do we actually need for this technique to work generally. So we need to be able to apply a policy and we need to be able to refer to the condition key, S3 account, within that policy. Uh, we need to be able to use wildcard matches. So this technique works by iterating and, and discovering more about the account as we go. So we start by saying, well, what's the first digit? If we had to get the, the entire account ID, which is 12 digits long, right the first time, this would be completely impractical. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it. And lastly, we need to be able to determine, based on our policy, whether that policy permitted or refused the request. And in this case, it's really clear, like the request is permitted or refused. Um, but this is actually the step which breaks down if a bu bucket is not public. I think we can still apply policies to the request, and you know, it's a policy like any other, but we can't tell the difference because the resource uh, policy is not permitting us access. So this case, is, this is where it breaks. We can't determine any information if all we're getting back is access denied, irrespective of our own policy. Uh, so the next step for me is like we need a better, a better flow chart. Uh, you may have seen this flow chart before. This is, again, AWS documentation. Uh, and this, this describes a bit more about the IAM process and the various policies and outcomes involved. Um, this isn't actually going to work for our use case because this, this is scoped just to within a single account. Uh, it's also missing a few bits and pieces, but it's, I, I think it's the best, the best one on the documentation. Um, but it gives us a lot of hope for, for an attack here because there are clearly many decision trees here, many, many blocks that we might be able to affect the, the outcome of. And there are also many like final blocks. You know, uh, there's, there's some allows and there's some, there's some denies. Um, and to make that more concrete, if I start with just the, the start of this flowchart, you can see the first step is evaluate all applicable policies. And so, so far, we've only been talking about like one policy, the identity policy, but there are many places that we can affect the outcome of an of a author, authorization of a request in AWS. And you can see the next step is says, is there an explicit deny? And if so, the final decision is deny explicitly. And this really caught my interest. I was like, maybe, maybe this, is, this is the way to go, because ordinarily in a cross-account case, you're not explicitly denying other principles. You don't need to. You're just implicitly denying them by not allowing them. So I thought, maybe if I put my own explicit deny in here, I can somehow detect that the request has been denied explicitly, um, as opposed to the implicit, implicit case. Um, and I'll show you an example of what I mean by detecting that. So this is an example from DynamoDB, which is another thing I investigated. 
Uh, DynamoDB has great error messages. You know, it tells you what was wrong when an access denied request occurred. So here it says, oh, there's an explicit deny in an identity policy. Um, so I know that that particular policy failed or didn't fail, and therefore I can infer condition keys from it. Um, so I thought, okay, this is, this, is, this is the way to go. This is the thing to investigate. So I created a policy like this. Um, it's a very simple policy. It has two statements. Uh, one allows all requests if I have a session tag of allow identity true, and one denies all requests if I have a session tag of deny identity true. And so by controlling which session tags I use when I assume this role, I can achieve the three possible outcomes of an IAM statement. I, I can have an, an allow, I can have a deny, an explicit deny, or if I just don't have any tags at all, none of these statements match, and that's an implicit deny. Um, and we mentioned there are lots of places to put policies as well. So not just the identity policy. I thought of as many as I could reasonably think of. I didn't investigate things like KMS key policies as well. That was kind of on the roadmap if this didn't work. But I did a very similar, similar setup for all the other policies um, using different tags, of course. Uh, this, this doesn't actually work for service control policies, SCPs. They don't like conditional allows and stuff. But there are, there are various things you can do to get around that. Um, and I just tried all the possible combinations. I basically just fired requests um, for each possible policy, each possible outcome, allow an implicit deny, an explicit deny. So in this example, you can see I, I used a role session name so I could kind of keep track of them and, and look them up in CloudTrail. Uh, and so here, yeah, my session policy is allowing it, but my uh, permission boundary is allowing it, but my identity policy is explicitly denying it. And basically, I want to see, is there anything I can do to affect the outcome in a way I can detect to draw myself a flow chart that works across account? Um, and I basically, I, this is the flow chart that I arrived at. Um, so this is a cross account scenario with various policies. And I'm not saying this is the internals of how it works in AWS, but in terms of what you can observe by using the services and in which order it tends to give you error messages in, depending on which policy failed, this is what I saw. Um, and what you can see is that you know, there is no concept of it. It looks in all the policies for an explicit deny and then complains about that first. It does what seems more logical policy by policy, checking that they all allow it. Um, and you can also see here, um, unfortunately for this research, that the logical thing to do first is to check the resource policy. Um, and so that's, that's what happens in the various services I tested, including Dynamo here, because it makes it more explicit what's going on. Uh, a resource policy, if, if you've not been allowed, that's an implicit deny. And so it just goes straight to deny. And nothing, none, none of the policies that we can control in the requesting account have any impact on this. So we, we just can't, we can't tell what's going on. Um, but anyway, I, I, you know, I, sent, I sent all these requests and I thought, OK, so we can't tell what's going on from the error message, but maybe there's some other property of a request that is going to be able to discern the difference between which policy actually allowed or rejected it. Um, and so I went digging in CloudTrail. And then I quite quickly discovered uh, pretty much exactly what I was looking for, uh, this interesting property that if a VPC endpoint policy rejects the request in CloudTrail, uh, sorry, in, in your VPC, um, the request does not appear in, in CloudTrail. Uh, and it's worth saying, um, so a VPC endpoint is like, it's, it's actually a really useful tool. It's like a private route from within your VPC to an AWS service. It's, it's great. It means you don't need to route out to the internet. Um, and it also allows you to apply a, a policy um, it, it can't permit the request. It's like uh, it's necessary but not sufficient. It's like a boundary kind of policy. Um, but yeah, this is exactly what I was looking for because it, you know this means that I can then go and um, iterate over this um, using it, exactly the same technique that worked for public buckets. So like just to make that more concrete here, so I put in my VPC endpoint policy. I only want to be able to request buckets which belong to accounts starting in one. And here, bucket example one belongs to an account starting with one. And so my request appears in CloudTrail. Bucket example two does not uh, start with one. And so it doesn't appear in CloudTrail. And so I've discerned information by doing so. And it's worth saying, like really pointing out here, that my request is always going to be denied, right? Like I am works. Uh, my request is going to be denied because I'm, I don't have any permission to access it from the resource policy. 
Um, but that, that doesn't really matter for this technique. Like the, the resource is, yeah, it's almost like not the important part. What's important is the request context that we induce IAM to construct, and we can then test yes or no questions against by applying our own policies to it. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I obviously wrote the code to, to iterate through, change the VPC policy, see if it appears in CloudTrail. I left it running overnight. It takes a long time to do. Um, as far as I can tell, for the like control plane change in the VPC endpoint policy to actually propagate out to the data plane, it seems to take about five minutes. And then you have to wait at least five minutes to convince yourself whether this event is going to turn up in CloudTrail. Uh, but anyway, it worked, uh, and I was excited, and I wrote to AWS security mailing list, and yeah, I was, I was excited, but I wanted to take it kind of a step further uh, because it was so slow. Um, so how I, how I took it a step further was with this kind of pair of conditions. Um, essentially, what I did is I, I constructed a condition which says, when I'm using the role session name starts with zero, only permit me to make the requ request if the resource account starts with zero. Um, and similarly, for it starts with one and starts with two, et cetera, et cetera, there are 12 digits in an AWS account ID and 10 possible options. And this just about fits in the like 20 odd thousand character limit of a VPC endpoint policy. And what that means is if you configure it in such a way, then your VPC endpoint policy can be completely static. And the digit you are testing and, and the option you, you, that you're trying out um, is basically amounts to what role session name you choose to use when you make the request. Um, so that brings the time down to about five minutes. You basically make all your requests in parallel, leave this policy exactly as it is, and then just wait for these role session names to filter through in CloudTrail join them all up, and you've got, you've got the bucket. The other, the other cool thing about that as well is that it means you can do multiple buckets in parallel. Right? You just correlate it all in CloudTrail when it, when it all comes through. Um, I was advised not to try a live demo. So this is a recording of, uh, of me running the, the code I wrote to, to test this out. Um, I've, I've got a cut in the middle there. Um, that is a real account ID and a real bucket if you want to want to try it out. Um, but yeah, uh, it, takes around, it takes around five minutes to, to do in total. Um, and if you do want to try it out, the only other thing I would say is, so you actually need to make sure you're, you're doing this in the right region that corresponds to the buckets region so that you actually do go through the VPC endpoint. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy to determine the region of a bucket. Um, and I released this code. Uh, it's available, available to use, and I'm excited to find out how some people have been using it already. Um, and yeah, I did, I did give, a, give a little bit of thought to like what I would do or what I would do if I was trying to break this technique. Um, and I kind of came back to those like three principles that I, I felt you needed for this kind of technique to work. Um, firstly, to be able to apply a policy conditional on the S3 resource account. Um, those keys are too useful. The resource condition keys are too useful for building like data perimeters and stuff. I, like, I think most of us would never want those to go away. Um, and I also thought like maybe you could only expose that information if the resource is public, but then your policy and its interpretation is contingent on another policy that you don't know. And that just felt too confusing to me. Um, uh, secondly, you, you could change this behavior as to like whether you can detect the difference in, in outcome um, by looking in, in CloudTrail. Um, but it's, it's not a bug. It's, this is like by design. Uh, it's by design to, to stop various kinds of exfiltration from within a VPC, uh, which again seems too useful to get rid of. Um, but one of the more interesting ideas I found was like to not permit this like string matching because that, that kind of lets you iterate and find the ID uh, one character at a time. Uh, there are some examples of like various condition keys, like those which relate to dates, which don't let you do like string matching just because it doesn't make sense. And I would argue that it doesn't make sense to do string matching on an account ID. Um, it, it either matches or it doesn't. Uh, there's no, no sense in a partial match. Um, but there are, of course, many different condition keys. And, and whether that makes sense will, will depend on the particular one. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I got to. And thanks for, thanks for listening to my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? 
I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious if, uh, when you contacted AWS, what was their response to this little technique you came up with? Um, so I contacted AWS and they responded within like their prescribed 24-hour timeline, um, and they said they were going to look into it a bit more. And they gave me they gave me timelines and they met them at every stage. Uh, in the end. I think this was like bucketed into a category like similar to the other enumerations of like I am and stuff that I'm sure many people are aware of. Um, so they said it was okay. Uh, question from the Slack: uh, How might you use the account ID that you managed to enumerate? Is it just a useful idea, just kind of for fun, or what? What are some uses for that? Oh, uh, for the account ID. Um, so uh, there are tools like Quiet Riot and so on, which can then go and find. Uh, I am resources associated with the account. There are, very, there are various things. Also, like being able to correlate two buckets as being associated with one entity, especially if you don't want that to be possible, uh, is interesting. But I would, I would encourage everyone to go to Jerome's talk tomorrow. Um, so you mentioned that when the call is made uh, from the in, inside of VPC and it goes to the endpoint, it doesn't pop up in CloudTrail. Do you know if it pops up in VPC flow logs? Uh, oh, interesting. No, I didn't. I didn't investigate that. I also didn't investigate like S3 access logs. Um, okay. Yeah, I think there's there's probably still some more things to find out about this. So there's something to look into. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? I've. Uh, do, did you run into any issues with like rate limiting or like hitting the like API calls way too much, getting flagged by anything? Uh, no, because I really, I mean, I was only doing this to test the concept, so like, uh, it sounds like there might be some more, more scaled uh, approaches. But you, you can, if you configure your own CloudTrail in such a way to get data events, you can do data requests and, and still achieve your same end. So I don't think, I don't think rate limiting is really gonna, gonna stop you. Uh, All right, uh, we'll wrap up here. There's. Um, break coming up. Uh, after the break, we'll meet back here at 3.50. The next talk is uh, making insights uh, driven decisions with an, uh, in an ecosystem of ecosystems. Uh, give it up one more time for Sam.